Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Cheryl Finley, and I am the director of the AUC Art Collective. It's my uh, great pleasure this afternoon to welcome Onaji Henderson, the director of Zucot Gallery in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, I'm really excited to have a conversation with Mr. Henderson this afternoon, um, especially uh, here he comes, he's joining us right now. Uh, we think about uh, current events, um, especially if we think about um, the way uh, in which, um, hi. Hello, how are you? Welcome, Onaji. Thank you, thank you. It's great Glad to see to be you. Here. Thank, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words about, about who we are. We are the AUCR Collective, the first and only undergraduate program in the United States, in the world, in fact, designed uh, to be a pipeline for African-American students at the largest uh, HBCU consortium in the nation, so um, Clark Atlanta University, Spelman College, and Morehouse College. Um, and I'm really happy to have you here with us today, Onaji, especially um, as I was starting to say before, um, the, uh, uh, regarding the events that are unfolding around the nation and the world today, um, uh, in response to uh, recent publicized and public uh, killings of African Americans, um, but also um, I think in response to considering the way in which um, Blackout Tuesday, uh, just two days ago, um, has affected um, not only um, the art world, but also cultural institutions and calling them out um, for some of the work that they still need to be doing, uh, some of the work that they are not doing. Um, so I hope that in our conversation today, um, which initially, you know, was a conversation, right? This is supposed to be talking about the, the art world. We're supposed to be talking about Zucat Gallery in Atlanta. We're supposed to be talking about how we support one another. Um, and we are gonna talk about those things for sure. But I'd like for us to be mindful of the fact that, you know, we are living in a moment where we have to actually address what's happening right now. Um, and that, you know, we're talking about a moment where art and social justice um, are colliding. And I think that when I think about um, as an art historian, as a, an astute reader of images, um, as, a, as, a, as a rebel, as a, one of my dear friends and uh, mentors would, would call me, um, I think that, you know, this is a moment where we really do sit back and we take into account um, how, um, if you study African-American art, if you study um, African diaspora art history, if you are um, a Black artist, um, it's unavoidable to have to um, consider um, and deal with um, these issues um, and to confront these issues head on every single day. Right. It's part of the work that we do. And, and with that introduction, I would, I would love to just welcome you once more, um, especially to talk about the kind of work that Zucat Gallery um, does um, as a gallery um, that is one that you said is unapologetically Black, right? It is a space for Black artists um, in Atlanta. It's a space for Black artists globally. Um, but what are some of the ways in which you think about and do the work that you do um, as a gallerist, but also as an engineer, okay? How many gallery owners out there in the world are engineers, right? Um, but you know, how do you do the kind of work that you do um, given, given this moment, um, given, it, it's not just this moment. I mean, I think the thing that I'm trying to express um, is that, you know, this is after like no sleep for all, how, who knows how long, but it's, it's, this this is this is this is daily. It's not just all of a sudden, right? Um, right. You know, right. there are cases yeah. that have been very publicized, but it, this is this is daily. This is part of the task of the kind of work that that we are charged to do. I think part of it is just uh, honestly, I, it's led by passion. Um, a lot of it, like the idea, and I think we, we spoke about it briefly in, in our previous conversations about the uh, the need to be or desire to be unapologetically black at all times. What that means is that creating spaces also where we can have these conversations and have these connections where um, we can be true. Uh, I, was, I was, you know, just being in a space where I've had clients come in and, and uh, they're talking about something and they'll whisper the word white. It's like, why are you whispering that? Like, it's, it's like you didn't say anything wrong in this case. It, it, but it's this idea, though, that we can't be ourselves 
in in spaces. Uh, number one, uh, I think the, the the responsibility of a of the gallery and what we're trying to accomplish um, is create number one spaces like that, but also uh, the idea that what we are, who we are, uh, is important, and it's important to this country. It's important to all different groups. We have a story to tell, and someone has to tell that story. Um, and so when things like this happen, it's just a reminder. I think every now and again, we can sometimes get extremely comfortable in thinking we're past certain places. And right. because it's not at, it's not in, at the space of, uh, it's, it's not just blatant, we think it's gone. And that is not the case. And also how important our stories are. Exactly. Um, you know, exactly. and, 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 and that we also never forget. So when people say they're tired of hearing about certain things, it's like, it, it doesn't work that way. And it's it, important it that we still it, have these I was just going to comment on uh, one of the comments that just came through uh, from Love the Artist. I love your tagline, Love the Artist, um, uh, which is that it's hard to be yourself if you don't feel safe, right? It's an issue of exactly. of safety. And and I think that's a conversation that we we had earlier this week about, you know, feeling as if when you walk into a gallery, when you walk into a museum, when you walk into Gucci, if you walk into Gucci, I, I don't typically do that, but you know, on whatever <laughs> avenue it might be, that you feel safe, right. you know, that you feel welcome, right. that you feel safe, that you feel, you know, validated in your, in your humanity to be in, in that space. So, so I, I wanted to um, ask you, um, or just, you know, give a little bit more of your, um, of your biography. You have a BS in mechanical engineering from Tuskegee, um, and you yeah. also have you know, a career in, you know, the corporate world working for the big five, but you're also a gallery owner and, and a director. And if you could just maybe give us a little bit more of an elaboration on, on your path, uh, one of the things we'd love to do um, in these conversations is to share with our students um, how it is that you can, you can kind of carve out a career that may not be the way that everyone else has, has done it in the past. Um, I want to echo Tyree Boyd-Pates, um, and uh, T.K. Smith, who've joined us, um, they've both been previous um, uh, um, interlocutors, uh, you know, on, on IG Live um, earlier and have really kind of set the bar, I think, for some of the ways that we are talking about, you know, how you can do and be, how you can be a curator, um, and you yourself as a, a gallery owner and, and director are also someone who um, is engaged in, in curatorial practice. Uh, but I, I just love to hear a sense of, you know, your your own path and how that might be something that our students can learn from, anyone who's on can learn from. I think that, um, you know, uh, my brother and I, my business partners are Amari Henderson, my brother, um, uh, and Troy Taylor. So the three of us, we're all engineers. Uh, and uh, what, we, what we're working on, uh, or, or what, the way it began is that my father, Aaron Henderson, is one of the artists in the gallery. But... It first started out, uh, my father's been a painter our entire lives. So we've always been around art. And my parents always made sure that we were connected to culture. So we went to, we were going to every different type of cultural festival from a very young age, right? And so we've always been around it. So when, it, when we went away to school, my brother's three years older than me. I remember he came home and got pieces just to put up in his room because it didn't feel like home. And so right. we've been around it our entire lives. And when I got out of college, when I, when I graduated from Tuskegee, um, we had a conversation and saying, look, we need to take over the business side from dad. And um, in doing so, we began to use our corporate dollars to run our gallery space here in Atlanta because what we realized is that we didn't have any friends who were collecting art. Now, I was 23 at the time. Uh, Mario was 26. And what we realized that it wasn't just our age group. It was a lot of us that didn't have this work. Now, we had engineering salaries. We had, you know, we were, we, were, we were making pretty good money. There was no reason why we wouldn't collect, but it, it became an issue of why don't we? And it was more about no one was even talking to us about it. And, you know, speaking to, to being comfortable in spaces, I can remember going to galleries and just feeling uncomfortable. Like people don't, people wouldn't speak to you. They completely ignore you. I mean, be, me right. being young and black, I was completely ignored. And so that's How where it began. You have to push the buzzer to try to get in the door. Right. Exactly. You know, yeah. take your hat off, smile, you know, all those, right. all those things. So, yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I, I just wanted to um, ask you about one of the things that you were saying about, you know, being an engineer and having, you know, a young engineer 
um, having been exposed to art, having an engineer's salary, um, yet, you know, your, your other friends and colleagues, they may not have had the same exposure. So you've always been very much about education. Your father, who was an artist and is a, a successful artist, um, was able to have a career out of making art, educated you about art because you lived around it and you observed him painting. Um, in the same way, you have gone out to educate your friends who are engineers about, well, you know, you've got this, not that it's necessarily excess salary, but you're at a point right now where you can actually think about how this might be something that you value as well. And I think about people in my own family. I often speak of the fact that my sister is a Spelmanite who is a chemical engineer and had a career at Procter & Gamble for, for decades. Um, but to think about, you know, how do you shift a perspective about what you know, what someone knows about to, to think about, um, you know, collecting art. And you, you, you mentioned um, a program that you have at the gallery that mm -hmm. I'm going to let you share with us. It's one of the ways that you've opened the door for so many. Right, right. It's called an art tasting where we talk about collecting, how to collect, why to collect, but not what to collect. And we've been doing them before we even had the gallery. So we were doing them initially and in, um, we started off doing them. We partnered with the Black Builder and we were doing them in, in model homes. Mm -hmm. And we'll grab people together and, and we host these events where we talked about collecting. We talk about materials. Why materials cost what they cost? Because a lot of times it's not that we don't necessarily want things around us in our spaces. It's that we, art sometimes feels like a place where you need to already know everything before you even come in to participate. And it's not right. the case. So we want to demystify some of those things so people felt comfortable. Because we shop. We spend money, you know. Right. But... It's this, uh, I think sometimes there's a, this intimidation factor that we have set out to completely um, dismantle in a sense because we want people to feel comfortable. We've even had, <laughs> over the years, we've now been able to do art tastings uh, literally in other countries um, and for Fortune 100 companies. And what's funny about it is that we, we did one once where we had a docent from the High Museum. At the end of it, she says, you know what? There's a couple of things in here that I didn't know the answer to. But I was afraid to ask anyone else, and I feel comfortable asking here. And so she even yeah. got some things that she would not do, you know. So right. it's a normalized thing. Yeah. And so you create a, a, a comfortable space. So I want to ask is, is that, is that uh, copyrighted, trademarked art tasting? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We've been challenged. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but one of the things that I, I like about that example is, um, is, is the way that, you know, as you say, it's, it's part about education, it's about normalization, but it's, it's also a way to, um, I think, open the door for so many different people and you open multiple doors at one time. It's this kind of like layered effect wherein um, we think in terms of the way that we're working with our students at the AUC Art Collective, that we're not necessarily trying to do art history or curatorial studies in the way that it's always been done, rather by infusing what we do um, infusing what we teach with social justice, with chemistry, um, with, in fact, engineering and biology, that we might be in the practice of creating students who are interested in doing art conservation, for example, or who might be interested in doing some of the really different ways of approaching how art might be displayed, like you are doing. Um, students who are thinking outside of the box, outside of the, you know, the white cube, uh, literally, um, mm -hmm. to go out and really carve up and create a new space um, in the art world. And, you know, it, it's, uh, it's important to be able to see things and, and, and ask questions. I think naturally as engineers, you know, we're trained to be problem solvers. And so right. we begin to look at things a little bit differently. And so you can ask questions of why are things done this way? And how long have been so much more technology now, so much more uh, information now? Why are we doing things the same way? And so I think the beauty of, of, of having a space is that we can try things. If it works for our clientele, then we could continue going forward with it. If it doesn't, that's fine. We can try something else. But it allows the, this space to try new things. How do, we, how do we solve this problem? How do we get more of us to collect our culture? Right. So, so can I ask you, just in, in terms of that question, um, what have you been doing differently now that we've all been sheltering in place? And I feel like you're in you know, this, this place where um, you know, we've got uh, one, one uh, person in leadership in the state of Georgia saying uh, the state's open, uh, but we know who we are. 
Uh, we know how susceptible right. we are to the pandemic, right? Um, and we know that we need to be extra cautious and care careful. Um, and we've seen that exhibited by other uh, leaders, in, especially in the city of Atlanta. What have you been doing um, at Zucot? Um, what have you been doing with your clientele, with your artists um, as a result of, of the pandemic? We began to look more at, uh, it's funny, when, when everything first started, I changed our, our page on, um, um, on our Facebook page to say pivot. And the idea behind it, I, we work in these uh, spaces of disruption and innovation and, uh, on the corporate side. And pivot is a term that's always used and we're always trying to think. So it challenged us um, to A, you know, we had to use more technology. Um, mm -hmm. We do something, first of all, we, we shut down everything because it was affecting us. We didn't want to be part of the problem and continue to spread this virus. And so one thing we did do, we, we just shut our doors initially. and. And what we made sure of is that at the same time, we realized we had to get more creative. So we started doing more, more media um, and start doing, we got in a few more articles just so people could still hear about things that we're doing in the space. Mm -hmm. But we also realized we can now have an ability to touch more through spaces like the internet. So uh, we've gotten a lot of clients in the past month or so from all over the country who are asking and inquiring about works. But I think part of it is that number one, we stay present uh in our space um we You're also about your, your online social space exactly okay. um we we began to do things and we created a hashtag zucat at home so we had our clients who are in collective showing what they were they work looks like in a home because it's so important a lot of times you're used to seeing work in galleries but you want to show people living with their collections and and so we did that and we were showing different types of homes uh we even did something called a hashtag called my zucat where people talked about why they began collecting. I think that's important as well, because you can show all walks of life, all ages in this space and understanding what their connection is to collecting. Like, why did they collect? Um, and, and that also helps. You know, a lot of times people come to the gallery because either a friend used to collect or, or has collected work from us, and they want some type of experience. And so we're able to show that now virtually. We also do something called virtual views. Now that's, that's more of the engineering side, I think, coming out. Uh, the virtual view piece uh, is uh, where we literally can tell the client, uh, this is a great example. I had a client out of Chicago call me two weeks ago and say, you know, I wish I could come down. I, uh, it's not safe for us to come down. And I said, where do you want to hang on? And so she uh, took some images of her home where she wanted to put pieces up. So what I do is I go in Photoshop and I create uh, an image that looks like it's on her wall. So I'll take that image, go in Photoshop, create a frame around a piece, shadows, angles, everything else, and she can see what it looks like in her home right? Um, and in her space. And so that way we've been able to just continue moving forward. But it also taught us that we could be doing this all the time. We've always done virtual views, but now it's really opened us up to say, okay, how do we work with more clients outside of Atlanta who don't have to come to us? We can create these spaces now where people can really see work at any point in time. Right. So it's almost like you're using your expertise in engineering, but also engineering and sort of architectural software that, I mean, what you're describing to me is also the work of a curator, right? Uh, it's the work right. of a gallerist, right. um, but it's also right. the work of a curator because when we go out to organize exhibitions and we have works of art, we have a space, we need to use this similar type of software to be able to insert those works in the space to understand, you know, what the exhibition is gonna look like, what the flow might be and how different pieces are in conversation with one another. Right. Exactly. Um, and you also, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll say, are you also, and part of this is really listening to those clients. So, you know, if they say they really want to, sometimes people use words like, I want a focal piece. And you're like, okay. Like, so I don't know what that necessarily means to them. But what I will do is I, a lot of times I also send them narratives about the work. So then they can become, a, the, the idea about this work, especially in homes, is that, you know, we talk about our tagline being uh, what you put in your home or what you, what you hang on your wall is a, is a reflection of you, who you are. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as a person, so, it can be so how do we connect to that as well? Right, right. And, and that makes me think about, you know, this like who you are, what you put on your walls is who you are. Um, and also where Zucat is situated. I'm going to get back to the question that we were already speaking about around, you know, what have we all done? How have we, how have we shifted? How have we pivoted, uh, using the jargon there, um, as a result of 
um, the pandemic, how have we pivoted? Um, and we probably just remain the same as a result of, of uh, un unrest and that that's, I think, a battle that we're always fighting every single day. But one of the questions that came through um, in just some of the comments just now was a one around a community. Um, and I think that you and I had a conversation about this in terms of, you know, when people just walk in the door. And the question was, do you contribute to community economic reform? Um, how might the gallery contribute to community economic reform? Could you address that question? Yeah, so a lot of things that we do, um, you know, being, you know, we're in a, arguably one of the blackest cities in America, progressive black cities in America. And at the same time, there's not many African-American art galleries in the city. And so how do you not feel a responsibility uh, in that space? Right. Uh, so, you know, the hard part about a gallery is that the assumption is that, you know, it's, uh, it's rolling in dough. And a lot of times, you know, the art business can be uh, very tough. Um, but Most times it is. Exactly, exactly. So what we do is we, we, do, we do things where, in regards to the community. We open up our gallery for uh, various types of events that, are, that focus not necessarily on just art, but when it's time to have conversations. Uh, but we also do field trips. We started this years ago. We're trying to get to young people. Um, I spent about a year trying to work with the school board and we never could get it to work. I, I was doing meetings. I had a curriculum built out for students. Wow. And fortunately, we found out about another program um, through the city, and we used that. And we, we were, we were uh, maybe, I'd say every, for, for maybe a, uh, each semester, we'd get about maybe three or 400, maybe even more than that, students come through those doors. And we already started doing it for younger students as well. So we had, we'd have six and seven year olds in there and we do something different with them. But ideally it's important for us to create this exposure that my brother and I were fortunate to have at an early age for other, for other students. And when we used to get, I can remember having students in there who would say things like, man, this is, it's gonna be boring as I don't know what, right? They would say things like that or worse. Right. But the idea was that they that. had never been, Exactly. Right. But, you know, what that happens, too, is that their experience with art, a lot of times, it was nothing of relevance to them, meaning they wouldn't even see themselves on the wall. Right. So when they come into our space, it feels different. We're playing music, you know, and, and we begin to talk about the business. We begin to talk about uh, why it's important to collect things uh, of substance or, or things that, that remind you of self. And so those have been our ways to to give back uh to and be not even give back but it's the responsibility we have uh as part of the community and for the space that we're in because what we're talking about the entire time is being custodians of culture as as things begin to change and happen it's our responsibility to pass down this information these works generation to generation to generation and we have right. to start it um, and continue it right and we and we talked about too um sort of the almost like this public image of, um, of what we might see in Atlanta with regards to, um, you know, to the, to the history of the civil rights movement. Um, I, I, I had talked about how as a newcomer to the city of Atlanta, um, that for me, you know, in the, in the public facing world, what I might see in a city park are images from the struggle um, in, in curated and specific um, photographic exhibitions that are outside. There was a comment um, that said, Zukat is a shining light. I wish that, that would come back again so I could have read it to you. I think <laughs> you might have seen it. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so I, I feel like there's like this real contrast between, you know, this really important work that you're doing and the imperative that the gallery has for um, the entire city of Atlanta, but specifically for black communities, plural in Atlanta, by engaging with students, by doing the work that the sometimes the school board doesn't have the resources to do or the interest to do. I mean, we can think about what it might have been like when we went to school, you know, years ago, where you had, you know, sports and athletics and, and art and other things that were already in school during the day, but now everything is kind of piecemeal. You've got to go a la carte to get that. And so you're providing a service not only for our youth, but I think that in terms of the kind of educational opportunities that you make available. You mentioned that you um, have done art tastings for other corporate entities um, outside of the United States. Um, you've also mentioned um, other larger groups like the Economic Leadership Council, where you've also been able to present. And I just wanted to know if you could say something about, um, 
you know, that aspect of, of the type of work that you do. And, and the point I'm trying to, to get to is to maybe back to the beginning where we were talking about this moment where we really need to think about art and social justice and also to think about the type of labor that we perform um, as Black people in this art world, um, the type of labor that might be a little bit different um, than, than other mainstream institutions um, ha have to perform um, in order to do the educational work that we do, in order to think interdisciplinarily across, you know, that, that an engineer is someone who engineers are, are, you know, bringing together a gallery like Zucat. Um, so that, that's one of the questions I really wanted to get back to. And, and in terms of thinking about the work that, that we're doing, and it just so happened, um, but that for, you know, one of the summer school online courses that I'm teaching at, um, at the AUC, it's on the Black Arts Movement, just so happened. Mm -hmm. You know, so a lot mm -hmm. of what we're seeing now in terms of civil unrest, you know, we know that it happened um, it has happened throughout the history, you know, of us being in the United States, but we also know it was in the 19 teens, um, you know, concurrent with the, the, the Spanish flu pandemic. Um, it was in the 1950s and 1960s, especially in the 1960s during the civil rights and black power movements um, as well. Um, but just to think about the ways that, you know, you continue to engage, I'd like to hear more about, about that um, in terms of, you know, the, that social, um, justice element of the work that you're doing. I think the idea, part of it is that you have, we, have, we have to understand and just accept the fact that we're never going to be necessarily invited to the party. So what we have to do is we have to get in there anyway, right? And so we become creative about the ways of the approach. So if, uh, for example, we began with looking at the idea of these chief diversity officers, right? And we began to ask the question to them saying, okay, are you living your diversity proposition? You know, I said, right. what does that mean? So like you say that, but you can show, you know, a white hand shaking a black hand and that's, that's your diversity for everything. You put it up on the wall, you got two business people smiling at each other, thumbs up, that's your diversity push. And you know, we you know can I just say something? So mm -hmm. I, I think I posted it. I, ha I haven't been to sleep before about one or two a.m. all week. Um, but I posted, I think like last night in the middle of the night, at some point I posted the poster of um, The Spook Who Set By The Door, the film poster. <laughs> I mean, that mm -hmm. is one of my all time favorite films, but you know, that's, I mean, that's an example of it, right? Right, that's an example right. Of it. And, and, and I know like this, this whole thing with Blackout Tuesday and you know, all the cultural institutions finally, you know, speaking up. I mean, we also know people who work in those institutions, people who look like us, who work in those institutions, who are subjected to microaggressions every single day. You know, so that that, that statement that might have been posted is completely, a, you know, 180 degrees different from what the experiences are of people who are, are working in those institutions, or perhaps even, you know, the programs that they might also run in terms of exhibition programs, and so on that you know where they put their dollars in terms of collecting etc right and so you you what, what happens is the same way we're creative in these other spaces we have to become creative in in getting into these places right so uh whether it be setting up this meeting with the chief diversity officer and asking the question um and i <laughs> i remember i was at one particular company and I was talking about this whole living university proposition. We were having this conversation, and he said, "You know what?" He said, "You know what?" He said, "Candidly, uh, this is." He said, "You put me in a bind." He says, "Because I want to tell you we can't afford it." He says, "But you got me in this position now where I also can't tell you no because of what you're talking about, and I know that our company can't say no to something like this." And so, by forcing their hand, a lot of times, because like I said, we're not going to be invited. So the idea behind it is that we have to figure out ways strategically to get in these spaces. And so, and once we're there, if it's, if it's just as much as I can connect to just the employees initially, that's fine. But I think what ends up happening a lot of times, these executives get these different things as well. And um, we even kind of came up with the idea of saying, okay, what about leasing them? Lease it for, for your corporation. Right. Well, let's see what happens. Like, what can we do to get these, these, this work in these spaces? And and not and not just and not just abstract work. We're talking we're talking figurative work uh, that shows our faces, that shows our uh, ideas, our thoughts, our strength, all of those variations of who we are on display in these spaces. Right, and I think that's such an important point that to to kind of 
you know, always have a workaround, always have a, a different way of entering into spaces. Um, and that, you know, that proposition of leasing is something that we've seen in, you know, in other formulations of, of the art world. Um, I do want to remind everyone who's on just today just to say thank you so much for joining us. And um, please remember that you can always use the question function to pose questions to us. Sometimes if we see them come up, we'll, um, we'll also answer them right here. But please use the question function if you have questions. Um, and I wanted just to ask if you could give some more examples about those kinds of corporate spaces that you've been able to, um, to work with in order to to get work um, into them. And I remember early on in, in my career, I started out as an art appraiser, working in, in photography specifically as a medium. And, um, and we had the opportunity to go in and out of major museums, but also corporations that were, um, that were collecting photography. And they always had you know, this one person, typically it was one person, uh, sometimes there might've been a team, but typically just one person who was there, who was their head you know, um, our consultant slash buyer that would help to curate the, the collection. And so I'm really interested to know um, how you might be changing what that, you know, what that, um, uh, what, what am I trying to say? What the, you know, how that, that typically might work. Um, you know, the idea of leasing is something I think that's really different, but also to be able to be in a space where, you know, you can say, okay, um, I'm gonna go through these different levels of management in order to suggest new works of art or new ways of presenting, especially the, the images that would show black people in these corporate spaces. Because I feel like that almost like what you're doing is, is almost um, more than um, what the person who's in this, you know, chief diversity officer position might actually be able to do. Because that person might be um, connected to HR, that person might be uh, someone who is hearing you know, different kinds of complaints that might happen within a corporate structure. Um, they might even be involved in, in doing uh, special targeted hires, but to be able to have something visually on display, um, that's mm -hmm. also growing a great, great distance in terms of educating everyone else who's in, in that space. We, we, don't, we, we initially started out working with just those different, um, I think they're called uh, was it ERGs, the different groups in, inside of companies for like, so for the, the, the African Americans at Microsoft, for example, or Coca-Cola. And, and we would do the art tasters through them. And of course we would, um, art tasters are completely free in the gallery, but corporate, they are not. And so we, uh, we would come in that, that way. Um, and typically their, their champion is usually an African American executive. Um, mm -hmm. And we can then, so they see this entire presentation. And they also see the reaction to, to, to the audience, uh, from the audience. And, uh, and as we talk about the narratives of, of these pieces and we talk about what, it, what the materials and, and how a lot of us are so unfamiliar with what, what some of our greats have created, but also uh, a lot of times there are a lot of not African Americans in the room too who realize it as well and begin to recognize the importance of it. But a lot of times, so, so from the initial start, we've been able to negotiate things like for Coca-Cola, for example, we did an entire exhibition for about a month inside of the uh, of Coca-Cola. Uh, and we're talking, um, and this, this is mostly figurative works that, that also spoke to, uh, I think one was actually a, an oil painting of a Sankofa. So it, it, went, it wasn't like uh, anything that was, uh, that was, you know, trying to toe some type of line. Um, right. We're gonna be, we know we're we're gonna tell our story, and we had the narratives up on the walls as well, and we got so much feedback. Even the curator for Coca Cola at the time, she came back and was just talking about how, a at the time she wished they they had it in the budget they had just the, the major layout they wanted to buy work because they saw the importance of it. Um, there's also articles about this where companies have put in works that employees felt offended by. And one of the CEOs says, you know, why do you feel offended? If it creates conversation, then we can deal with that. We can handle that part of the, this offense. So our way has been, we've been fortunate to have a number of executives as clients. So the good thing about, or the great thing about art and selling art is that you create friendships with people you may have never met, you know, otherwise. Right. And so, and so we've also been able to jump the line sometimes and saying, okay, you're CEO of this company. If you want it, who's going to tell you no? Right. And so 
we're able to do that as well. So is that's it, been so our, is, that, is that how you answer that question when someone says to you, um, "Ex employee felt offended by this"? Is that is that how you answer? Like, how do you deal with that? Do you then go back in and and do a layer of education? How do you deal with that type of comment? I think a lot of times it's based on that company as well. A lot of times the company can they they can withstand it, right? So like. If you have that narrative next to it and you have to ask the question, why do you feel offended? And if, if they can't even answer that question, they think sometimes that you just feel uncomfortable. And, and, and is it really offense? It, you know, um, and a lot of times it's not. It, it's more about you. You're not the same. We're not seeing ourselves in these spaces. Neither are they. And so that offense comes from something else. So a lot of, that's why the narrative is typically up next to the piece when on display. So you can read this about. And they go through and we make sure that they understand what that narrative is prior to. So then it, it becomes a talking point as opposed to something that causes divisiveness. Right. So, so can you share um, something about like, I'm trying to imagine it, when you go into corporate spaces, just as an example, are you, is this a social event in terms of how you might present an art tasting or is it, is it more of a, uh, a lecture where you're presenting images um, on slides or something like that. It's a it's a it's a lot more laid back. Um, when we come into a space, we typically uh, we set up work, but we begin to talk in a conversation typically led by an artist. So it's led by my father, typically Aaron Henderson, um, and he comes up and we just we just say ask the, we just start up the the entire thing by saying who all collects, you know who collects art, or no I'm sorry who collects period. And no one raised a hand typically. It was okay. Who, like, who collects shoes? All right. Who 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 collect who collected Jet magazine? And you know, people will start laughing or raise their hands. And it's showing that collecting is natural. We all collect things, some things. And then we begin to, to, to talk about it from a standpoint of the art. So it loosens up the audience. But then we also have so you can talk and ask questions any moment in time through this presentation. We start with materials. We pass out. So we say. This is what cotton rag paper feels like. This is how much raw linen costs. You know, this is what a stretch is like. So we start very, you know, very specific and let people feel and touch things, and we go from there. I love that you start with materials. And when I think about our program in art history and curatorial studies um, at the AUC, our students are required to take classes um, in the plastic arts. They need to take a class where they learn about whether it's photography or documentary film or 3D installation, because it's extremely difficult to be able to write about something or to understand the curatorial practice or, or works of art themselves if you don't really know how they're made, right? right. Um, right. You, can, you can have a studio visit, but you really need to know a little bit more. So those materials are so important. And I think that that's a, a way to enter um, in such a way that there's a really nice level level playing field. Um, I wanted to ask if I could just switch uh, to a couple of questions that have come through the question um, uh, function, if that's okay. Sure. All right. Okay, so there's one uh, question that asks, this is from Hannah Ryan, um, who is one of my graduate students. Actually, she is a professor um, at St. Olaf College in Minnesota, uh, but she was one of my graduate students at Cornell. Hello, Hannah. And she asked the question, do museums and other cultural institutions regularly support your gallery? No, no. Um, and that's an area um, that we're, we're still trying to work to figure out. I think a lot of, I think, you know, artwork by African American artists in general, I, I've had conversations with the High Museum years ago here in Atlanta. And I remember being told by one of the, the top doctors at that time about the idea that he was like, you know, honestly, he was like, you're not going to see many African American works in here um, at all at the time. I think the High Museum is trying to make a little bit of a difference now, but currently that's not what we see. Um, and I, I don't think many African American art galleries see, see that. Um, but so I'm trying to understand the question. I thought the question was about like, do they, do they buy from you? And, no. and that's the, so the answer is still no. Yeah, so we've had a couple of smaller, I think um, a, a, a couple of smaller universities mm -hmm. with museums have purchased from us. Mm -hmm. um, and some of our purchases have come more from collectors purchasing and then donating to these, mm -hmm. to these places, but not directly, no. Right, right. Mm -hmm. 
that's a, well, it sounds to me like they need to have an art tasting. They do. You know what I mean? I mean, that, <laughs> yeah. that's, you know, not, not that you need to always have to go in and do that type of work. You would think since they are another museum and cultural institution, they should not have to be educated in that way. But it sounds like that might be something that, that uh, might open some doors. I'm not sure. Um, right. And we've been, we've been fortunate to have, um, you know, some collectors who are on, you know, boards, museums, and we actually just had uh, some work uh, at the DIA in Detroit and um, in some other areas, but that's still, once again, it came through collectors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I find that so um, disconcerting, especially when I think about mainstream galleries that um, have direct lines to um, as you said, not only the curators at major museums, but also to their boards of directors. Uh, because that's, as you said before, that's often how um, some of those the works get into museums because someone has purchased something that will ultimately be donated to the institution. I'm sorry, you're, you're breaking up a little bit on me. Um, okay. Uh, can you hear me now? It's a little bit of an echo. I, I, uh... Is this? What, you're, 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 you're frozen on my screen. Okay, um, um, I'm, you're not frozen. Maybe just, can you check your signal? Sure. Yeah, sometimes it's the signal. I, I, I often get um, like a weak signal at some point during the conversation. Is that, I think that's better. I can hear you now. Okay, great. So there was another question. Um, this is from Natasha Shambliss. Um, what's next mm -hmm. for Zucat? Virtual is nice, but there is something special about seeing the works in person. And yeah. um, and I, I will say, you know, we we've been. I know we're all struggling with this. Um, I mean, we're human. We're social. Um, our artists are struggling with this. Museums are struggling with this. Um, curators are struggling with this. Um, really trying to figure out a way to enable. Um, our students, um, collectors, um, clients, um, the ability to have sort of this, this object-based um, interaction with works of art. That's something that's, that's missing. And, and I, I liked how you began by talking about um, the program that you use that enables someone who might want to purchase something, get a sense of where it might be in their space. Um, but what else can we do? What else is there? How do we, how do we bring back that human element? I think, you know, the, the, the hardest piece right now with this pandemic is just wanting to make sure everyone is safe. I mean, me personally, I actually, I have asthma. And so I'm, I'm susceptible as well to uh, what's going on right now. But uh, to answer Natasha's question, we're putting together some protocol now. That actually, I think it's going to go out next week, if I'm not mistaken, um, of what we're doing. We're, we're currently doing a, a few appointment by appointment only right now. Um, and... In doing so, you know, we're making sure that we have masks at the gallery. We're, uh, we have a hand sanitizer that's going to be at the door. Uh, things like that that we're doing. But we're, we're, until everything gets really safe, we're going to still have to limit the number of people in the gallery at one time. Um, so we, we're playing now with ideas. We've been in conversation with a, a couple other uh, galleries um, about how to do this uh, in a way. Because I, I, I agree uh, the same way. Like, when you, if you see an image of a piece and you love it, you know, how you, when you see it in person, it would be completely different, maybe even more so. And so right. I understand that connection, especially for someone like us who are in sales of these works. Um, it's really important that we get back to it, but when we have to be sure that we're responsible in doing so. Um, and, and so because of that, right now, for example, I had a client in the gallery this past week, and I was masked. She was masked. You know, and as we walked around, we actually we wiped down the stair, the, the the stairway rails and everything else in between each visit, but doing things like that I mean, to help. And I, and I understand the difficulty in buying online, so that's why we, we offer that, but it still has to be appointment only. And the hardest part sometimes with that is that we, it's rather fair way to say if you're interested in purchasing, we'd love to set an appointment because otherwise, a lot of times people come by to, to just see, and, and, and in normal circumstances, that's great, but in, 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 in this time, it's kind of difficult to just open it up at all times because right. of what's going on right now. So we right. have to figure out the balance and what that balance may look like. Right. Um, yeah. Right. So, um, so there were a couple of uh, comments. I think you saw them that, you know, that it's difficult to buy online, especially for beginning collectors. 
Um, one question I have for you, and I'm going to get to the other question that Curtis Grayson um, has asked um, in a minute, but I wanted to know, um, you know, if you were to buy something online and you get home and you don't like it, can you, can you return it? Um, Cause I'm thinking about like, sometimes I, I bought um, from auction online. Um, mm -hmm. These are not works that are necessarily like brand spanking new. So, you know, there might be an issue with condition. It might be a rare book or, you know, an old photograph, et cetera. What, what type of policy is in place for that? So we've never had an issue in the past, but we do have something where you have seven days, uh, like to, to inspect the work, look at the work. It, because the work is new, um, it's, it's pretty much, it's going to be what you see, what you see is what you get typically. Um, and, and, and so for the most part, we, we, because of all the things we do ahead of time, we usually get, you know, I really liked it when I saw it. We did the virtual views. I love it now that it's in my home. I just did this with a client in Iowa uh, about a month ago. And uh, she, she sent me a note back just saying how much she loves it, how much she's ready for her next set of pieces. But I think we're also, you create this level of comfort and conversation. So the sales cycle is longer, of course, during this time. But um, I make sure that we, we do everything we possibly can, whether it be from videos and everything else to try to secure that. But if, if that is the case, we will work with you to figure out the best way to, to solve that issue. Okay, great. So... One question was, does Zucat, does Zucat Gallery only exhibit figurative works? And what is the protocol for submissions? No, not at all. We, we, we uh, work with sculptors. We work with, we, of course, work in abstract work as well. I think um, the, one, the one area that, as we talked about before, is, uh, photography is one area that we don't necessarily uh, work in as much. But uh, We're going to work together. Exactly, exactly. But you're going to help me out with that part. So, uh, and help us out on the on that part of the art taking as well. So we get a little bit more information there yeah. or share a little bit more information. Now, in regards to submission, you'll find the submission piece on the website. And I know uh, when, Lauren was, when Lauren Harris was with us as well, we used to always talk about the importance of following the directions on the site in regards to submission. Um, as you can imagine, we get a lot of submissions, but we want to make sure that we're sent exactly what we asked for. Uh, so we're not going to hunt down your uh, your your site and look through your work and you know all that good stuff. We want to we want if, you, if we ask you to send submit five images, we're looking for just five images. We're looking okay. for your resume, look things like that. So we just ask that you follow the directions there because for us that also talks about you know in business we want to have you know good business partners as well. And so we want to make sure then that we can we can go through and see these things and it allows us to be able to say okay step one. They've been able to, to submit to us. And, and, and a lot of times it may even take a little bit of time for us to get back to you because of what we get uh, in regard to submissions. Right. Okay, so let's talk about the business side. Uh, would you recommend to our students to get into the business side? And if so, um, are you mentoring any young people now to work with you on the business side of what you do? Uh, we, we're always mentoring uh, someone, it seems, uh, uh, just in conversation or just trying to help out as much as we can. I think that it's important to understand that this is a business. Um, so many times, you, you know, if you, you have to be able to separate your love for art in general to, okay, now I'm in this demographic. I know this is the type of work that sells. This is the personality of this gallery. And I think that's the area that we have to also concentrate on. And so you have to be able to separate the two. And you also have to have uh, money. In a sense, I mean, without saying it in any other way, it, it, it costs. Uh, when I, when I, somebody describes, when I describe the gallery, I was talking about imagine um, real estate. Uh, right. And every piece of that wall is real estate. If nothing sells that month, you have to cover mortgage at the same time. You have to cover staff and everything else as well. So every single month, you're, up, you're, you're chasing a number. <laughs> no matter what, and I think, and I know that that that, that that's you know very uh, I guess uh, very basic when it comes to business, but in in art and art business is very real as well. And a lot of times you don't think about that aspect of it, I and mean, it's really important to remember those things. So for me, for example, I still go out at times and I'll do contract work uh, in the in, in, in the in the engineering space or innovation space um, right. and things like that, because what this is for us now. This is definitely a business. We're fortunate to be uh, successful in what we're doing. But at the same time, it's also important to remember that anything, including what Trump said tomorrow, can affect 
our 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 cash flow immediately. Right. And so uh, artists consider the ultimate luxury. And so because of that, it can be extremely volatile at the same time. Um, and so that's why we also had to get creative in other ways of making money uh, through the business. But I think that it's important to remember those things. I would encourage anyone who wants to be in this space, we, we definitely need more of our faces in this space. So, yes. Uh, definitely. Absolutely. You know, the, it just it just has to, has to make sense for you as well. Because you need to be able to live off of this also. Right. Right, right, and and we want to support artists, and we want to support you. So, so one quick question: remind me how long has Zucat been around? We've been there about ten years now. You said about two. Ten. Ten. That's what I thought. Ten. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So ten years. So so then ten years. I was going to ask, just thinking about you know the the business aspect of it all. Um, thinking about what you said about you know we don't know uh, depending on what's happening you know in the public sphere how that might affect um, you know people's ability to buy to collect to support um, have you noticed um, in the years that you've been in business at Zucat and also in the years that you've been um, in in the business of collecting art yourself and being aware um, in the art world how you were or how especially the segment of of the art world that you're especially attuned to was affected by say the market downturn in 2007 2008 there are many people who say that you know even with a recession um you know art holds its value even with a recession um you can have prices going up or you can still have art selling do you still feel that's the case i do i i do especially now um, what's happening now is that uh, I think a lot of our collectors now want images around them that reflect who they are more than ever now. Um, you know, the divisiveness that we have in our country right now mm -hmm. is just a reminder, like, when I come home, I want to see images that make me feel good, you know? Right. Um, and I think that personal piece of it uh, helps a lot, but also, you know, as African Americans, we, we can't forget our, our need to participate in the secondary market so our values of our work can also increase uh, at, a, at, a, at a rate um, that's faster than what we currently see, of course. And, and the idea of, of being able to uh, use auction houses and, and create our own auction houses. And so we can really begin to also look at that evaluation in the future. Um, um, so, but currently I would say that many people right now uh, are calling us Simply because they say things like, I had a client literally call me last night and say, you know, I have a three-year-old and I have a, a, a one-month-old uh, girls. And he said, it's important they grow up understanding and knowing the stories that affect us. Right. And so what better way is to have these works on the walls that, it, that, and then, that they can also then have and pass down. And right. so that's the, that's the mindset we're all in. This, this, this whole time, this pandemic, all these things, uh, as terrible as all this stuff is happening, I think it's a bit of an awakening for some of us as well. I, I, I would agree with you. I would really agree with you um, with that statement. Um, I'd like to also just uh, ask you one question that was uh, forwarded to us in the question function. And I want to remind um, both of us that we have uh, about five minutes left and um, Instagram Live is going to cut, cut us off <laughs> in five minutes. So we want to make sure we get to what we want to talk about. Um, and if anyone else has another question, please send it along. So this is from Malik Norman, uh, and he says, uh, thank you for your time and creating the space. I was wondering what advice you would give to artists for expanding their practice. Um, I would say in regards to expanding, are you saying in the, the type of work you do or is it the type of? Uh... You can just take it, take it in, in, which, in whichever okay. direction you. Like, so I don't know that we'll get an answer back by then. I would say it's a, it's important number one to uh, find your voice uh, and be true to it. Um, in regards to, I'll give you an example. Many artists who are working on various series right now have done research prior to doing that series, mm -hmm. and sometimes it takes understanding either uh, a certain perspective or understanding it uh, a subject matter completely, and then creating and what comes out of that. I think. Um, uh, can change based off of your knowledge of a, a particular area. Um, I think also in expansion, I think 
on the other side, I think it's also important to create work. Uh, we have so many, we have so many uh, artists who come to us and say, man, I, I love the gallery. I want to be in the gallery. Can I, you know, can I be in the gallery? Uh, what do I need to do? And they say, I have about five pieces. And we're like, we need you to come with, with work. Uh, right, right. So you have to have more than that. Exactly. And yeah. complete ideas and work that's done on, on high quality materials and that comes framed and it's conservation framed or all those things that, that matter to, to us on our side as well. We need, we need that to happen. Right. And I think, I think I would also add to the answer to that question um, and especially connecting it to, you know, this current, um, you know, political, economic, social um, uh, moment that, you know, that artists should also be thinking about, um, thinking about the archive. Um, I think that there's a way to begin to think more expansively about your practice if you think about um, doing your research and, and, and looking into what, what's there in the archive. So that if we can say, I think one of the things that, statements that I find so disconcerting um, that we've heard um, again and again, oh, we're living in these unprecedented times. It's so unprecedented, unprecedented, unprecedented. It is not unprecedented. Right. I'm sorry. It is not. It's been, right. you know, since Black people set, for, set foot here, It's it's been since, you know, Indigenous people um, have been colonized. It's been for a really, really, really long time. And, you know, with that said, this is not an unprecedented time. And, um, and I think that, you know, we can actually look through the archive. We can look at the archive of the history of slavery and the slave trade. We can look at the archive of, you know, abolitionists who were working in the 18th and 19th century. We can look at the archive um, that relates to the post-Reconstruction era um, and the kinds of images. There was an article that I read that was really, really powerful um, uh, about a week ago comparing some of the images that we have um, now of the, the recent uh, publicly um, uh, uh, witnessed uh, murders um, to the photographs from um, from the the 19-teens and earlier of people who were lynched, right? right. Um, so, but if we look at those kinds of archival images, I think that for you know those of you who might be artists on this call, um, if we look at the archive, that might be a way to think about exp expanding one's one's practice to be able to connect the moment in which we live in now, um, you know, what's relevant now. Um, to the past, that that kind of gives a through line and also talks about, you know, this notion of, of legacy, too, and the way that you, you know, are really carrying on a legacy in your work. So I feel like I've spoken way too long, and I think we've got about, like, 59-ish seconds. Well, I, will, I, I will say last this. word? <laughs> I will say this. It is, it is so important to understand who we are at a, such a deeper level to be able to communicate that in a different format, right? So like to be able to have these spaces where you understand things enough to be able to now translate them and also recognize the fact that so many, so much of this stuff is, is, uh, has not changed, unfortunately. But our right. story, and, and to speak more from the side of resilience and what we've been able to survive instead of the, uh, instead of the latter. Right, exactly, yeah, exactly. And, and there was one last question I didn't get to, um, but now it's telling me we have one minute and 41 seconds, so we'll see. We'll be getting cut. But uh, <laughs> the last question was about, you know, how much international work do you do? And maybe we can fold that into, you know, the, the topical moment of what's happening now and also how artists can expand, you know, what it is that they do. Um, we haven't done much. We've, uh, we did our very first international uh, trip last year. We went to now St. Kitts and Nevis, and then we're doing some work down there. Uh, we were able to do some work with the Four Seasons down there, and uh, as well as a partner gallery, uh, Dale Fine Art in St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, and I think for us, it was it was for us it, it was a, a time for our, our, an ability for us to now go to a different market. Um, but there is a place where people from all over the world come. So it expands our market without having to go literally across the world. Um, right. um, we went during uh, Yacht Week, actually. Um, and we were, we've been down there ever since. For, so we've been down there now for about a year. We took about uh, 70 of Aaron Henderson's paintings down there. And that was because of uh, a certain series that really relates well to uh, the Caribbean. Um, and so there's a movie. 30 seconds. OK, so, so that series is uh, what we focused on. So, that expansion, we're still going to do more with that, but it's just the cost and insurance and everything else that makes it difficult to get to those places. Right. Okay. So thank you so much, Onaji Henderson. 
Thank you so much, Zucat Gallery. We are so mm -hmm. happy that you are here and we love your space and we will be looking forward to seeing you in person soon. Great, I look forward to meeting your students as well. All righty, take good care. Thank you again. Thank you. Take care, bye. Bye.